Welcome to All Grown Up Now, a tale of retail, relocation, revenge, reinvention, reckless behavior, really good clothes, indiscretion, infidelity, domestic violence, and one kidnapping. I'm Kenneth D. King, podcasting from my studio near Union Square in New York City. This podcast is another in a series of installments from a novel I wrote called All Grown Up Now, A Friendship in Three Acts, available on Amazon.com. It's the story of a small-town boy who dreams of being a grown-up and his journey to get there. Each week, you'll hear another installment of this story. I am pleased to announce that BearWorldMagazine.com will be one of the sponsors of all of the episodes going forward. Act two begins a new phase in the friendship between Mark and Ken. Ken had his revenge and started spending quite a lot of time away from Mark. In act one, the relationship looked somewhat like a parent-child relationship, with Mark serving as the parent-older brother figure to Ken. In this phase, unconsciously, the friendship changed to one of the child going out into the world and leaving the parent behind. Episode 11 begins Act 2. The place is San Francisco, California. The time is April 1995. Flash forward to a plane from San Francisco to the Burbank airport. There was plenty of time to think on that flight to Burbank. Really, I believed that I would never hear from Mark again, especially after our last conversation. As it was, I hadn't laid eyes on him in nine years, and boy, oh boy, that was one depressing visit. He and Victor were living in this crappy little house in Long Beach. Quite a lot of his antiques were nowhere to be seen. The place was covered with a film of stale cigarette smoke and regret, and the whole conversation consisted of how miserable he was. From then on, until our final conversation, we had what I call a telephone friendship. He never came to visit, and I never went to visit. We talked on the phone. So I really couldn't imagine what Mark even looked like now, let alone what kind of person he had become. The voice on the phone made me think that the person I was going to bring back to San Francisco was a shadow of the man I first met in Oklahoma City. During our final conversation back in 1990, which was five years ago, I said what I needed to say. I wasn't helping Mark by listening to him complain, and the frustration of not doing any good was making me crazy, so I had to break with him. However, through the years, I thought of him often and hoped that he was okay. My fear, though, was that he would end up as a sordid headline, Gay Man Found Beaten to Death, Longtime Companion Disappears. I also contemplated the headline the papers might soon use, If things went horribly wrong, fashion designer found shot to death in botched kidnap attempt, was wearing clean underwear, and had his roots freshly done. Place, San Francisco. Time, spring of 1982. Mark and I kept in touch after he left Roos Brothers, and I understood that talking to him about the job was off limits. But... As I had had my revenge, I stayed off that topic. There's revenge, and then there's unkindness. I know that sounds peculiar, but that's how I am. Soon after Mark left Roos Brothers, he and Vic moved from their flat on Noe and 22nd to an apartment on Corbett Street in Twin Peaks. It was one of those concrete apartment blocks put up in the 1960s, one that lacked any charm whatsoever. Mark's job was to be the manager of that apartment building, or so I was told. He never held another real job for the rest of his days in San Francisco. After they moved on my first visit there, I noticed that more of Mark's antiques were missing. Some of the silver was gone, too. So sad. When I asked about them, Mark started to answer, but Vic entered the room, and the subject was very abruptly dropped. Right about this time, I met Matt. I refer to him as my trophy husband 
because he looked really beautiful naked. Really beautiful naked. Really beautiful naked. But more on that later. Mark wanted to meet him, so we went over there for dinner. This was the Mark I remember bringing out all of the good dishes, but not as many dishes as I remembered from Oklahoma City, and cooking a whole restaurant full of food. Mark was his usual Jewish mother self, the anxious host, always jumping up and making sure that everyone had what they needed. I was used to that. It's how he entertained. He was polite to Matt, but seemed to be keeping a distance. Victor, however, was giving Matt the hairy eyeball the entire time. He also kept shooting Mark looks, which seemed to make Mark nervous. Then Mark would be more the anxious host. It was a downward spiral of sorts. I was oblivious to all of this because that's the way Mark and Vic were. I was used to it. Matt was polite, made all of the necessary conversation, kept away from Victor, and seemed to enjoy himself. But in the car on the way home, he let me know what he really thought. I don't know why you hang around with them, he said. There's something creepy going on there, and I don't know what it is. But I was uncomfortable the entire time. Victor looked like he wanted to jump me, and Mark looked like he wanted me to leave because Victor wanted to jump me. There was no response I could give, except, well, that's just how they were. I met Matt through Susan, who worked with him at the Greyhound corporate offices. She had invited him to guest usher at the Opera House a few months after I started ushering there. My gig with the bishop was winding down, and I was establishing some sort of social life outside of Mark and Vic, so I was up for meeting new people, especially cute guys. Matt showed up wearing an obviously borrowed suit, shirt, and tie, and worn-out military Oxfords. Poor Matt was desperately in need of a trim, black mustache and hair, but otherwise he had a rugged but slightly geeky Marlboro Man charm, sort of like a young Clark Gable, complete with the jug ears. We sort of sniffed around each other during intermissions and exchanged phone numbers. At the time, I was living in Noe Valley, which was too far away from the opera house to walk, which meant I had the car. So I offered to drive him home, as it was sort of on the way, after some coffee. To my surprise, we didn't go to bed that night, quite unlike me, to be sure. We had a real serious goodnight kiss in the car, but that was that. I couldn't wait for our next date. That occurred a few nights later when he came over to my place. We had a bite to eat and eventually ended up naked. Now, Matt was one of those people who, in clothes, looked sort of nerdy, but out of clothes, well... I was astonished to see before me this lean, wiry guy who looked like a hairier version of the guy in the Calvin Klein underwear ads that were just coming into the market. You know, the ones that Bruce I'm Not Really Gay Weber photographed with the model wearing just the white briefs posed against stucco and shot from below? It was a surprise to see this gorgeous vision in white briefs. And from the very first, I was a bit glamored by his charms. Looking back, I really didn't think much past them at first. His charms, and his briefs, that is. Matt had just returned to the States from being stationed in Japan with the Air Force, where before his term was up, he suffered the hazing that gays in the military get once the knuckle-draggers discover the truth. He was originally from San Antonio, so that's where all his belongings had been shipped and were stored. Then there was also an ex-wife and a child back in Minnesota, where she was originally from. It seems she didn't go to Japan because they separated just before he was stationed there and they divorced while he was away. Matt moved to San Francisco after divorcing and sort of went wild, what with lots of drinking, no doubt some drugs, and lots of sex. The sex wasn't so much a problem in itself, because everyone was doing it a lot then, it was really like a handshake, But he chose risky situations like giving a blowjob in a doorway across from the police station at high noon, and he had druggy friends to carouse with. He lived in a studio apartment on Fulton Street near Webster, in a building right across from the projects, and a block away from the notorious Pink Palace. He slept on the antique Murphy bed in his apartment. I did too when I was there. 
It made lots of noise, sort of like a big Morse code machine, tap, tap, tapping to telegraph to the neighbors downstairs that we were at it again. It drove one of the neighbors crazy, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Soon after we started dating, his son, Pete, came to visit. Pete was nine years old at the time and slept on the Herculon sofa in Matt's place. Having Pete around was a bit weird for me. I always regarded being gay as a blessing in that I didn't have to deal with children. Now I was fast becoming a stepmama. Thankfully, Pete liked me, because if he hadn't, it could have been hell. His mother in Minnesota was mad as hell about the divorce, even though she knew that Matt swung both ways before she married him. It puzzles me to no end why women persist in the notion that once a bi guy has had the love of a good woman, he will forsake men forever. Rubbish. Then, when the old hankerings return, these gals get all upset because the guy can't switch it off. The ex sent long letters, venting her spleen about how could he leave her after all they had been through and what about their son. At the time, Matt made her out to sound irrational, but looking back, I can better understand why she was angry. But I had to look at the other side of the bisexual question as well. When Matt and I got together, I really didn't think much about the flip side of the coin. We were banging like rabbits every night for the first six months or so. Then he was living with me, and I had to address the issue after I was into the relationship for a while. The bisexual issue showed itself in several ways at several times. Matt had this ongoing attitude that since he had actually put his penis into a vagina, he was more of a man than I was. I'm what some gay men call a thoroughbred, a Kinsey Six, never had sex with a woman, not even a kiss, and proud of it. Whenever Matt would start with the more of a man because I fucked a woman attitude, my response was something along the lines of, when you can hang drywall, fix the broken spring on the garage door, and tune up the car, we'll talk. When we split up, I'm told by Andy, the woman he briefly took up with, that he would meet her at the door wearing high heels and pantyhose. That pair of pumps of mine had gone missing. I had wondered where they went off to. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Occasionally, Matt would go into his fantasies about having a woman in. I would counter with my fantasy of having a woman in, which involved her scrubbing windows and floors while I watched from the sofa. Uh, you missed a spot. That would usually put an end to the discussion for a while. Every now and then, Matt would use the if you haven't tried it, how would you know you wouldn't like it argument. My response after suppressing the inevitable wave of nausea was I haven't tried drinking poison, driving my car off a cliff, poking my eyeballs with sharp sticks, yanking out my fingernails with pliers, etc. either, but I know I wouldn't like it. One has a feeling for these things. What I'm trying to say is something that will be regarded by some in our community as not PC. Bisexuals should mate with each other and leave those of us who can make up our minds alone. This is my experience anyway. Matt was living on very little money, and his neighborhood was really dicey. I lost four trunk locks on my car to denizens of that neighborhood and did what my friend Sandra calls the park and run whenever I would visit. For this very reason, we spent increasing amounts of time at my place. The event, though, that spurred me to invite Matt to move in with me occurred late one night in October of that year. He was sleeping and awoke to the sounds of someone raising a ruckus by stomping on the roof directly over his bed. Forgetting where he lived, he got up and went up to the roof to investigate. Foolishly, he opened the door to the roof when... This wild-eyed man on the roof charged at him, screaming how he was going to kill the faggot. Well, Matt hightailed it back down the stairs, missing a few on the way and breaking a toe. He barely got into his place and the door locked behind him before the guy crashed into the door. It was the downstairs neighbor. He had finally been driven crazy by the Morse code tapping of the Murphy bed. Police were called, the emergency room was visited, and Matt was out of work for a month. This caused him to miss child support payments, which caused the ex to take him to court. His bank balance was seriously into the negative numbers, and he was scared to leave the apartment. With the ex-wife hounding him for money and his homesickness for his belongings in San Antonio, I offered a possible solution. Come live with me in my studio apartment, what was I thinking, 
until he had saved enough money to pay first and last and get his things moved here. I reasoned that it would take no time at all if he didn't have to pay rent and would afford him the chance to get into a better neighborhood. My one rule was, no tricks in my place. So the day before Thanksgiving, he moved in and promptly broke a crystal vase that my sister Kathy had given me. This was an omen, but I was too naive at the time and didn't see it. He looked good in those white briefs, so I chose not to see this red flag. Our first Christmas in 1982 was spent apart like all the others. I went to Oklahoma City, and Matt stayed at my place. He had plans to go to Susan's house for their annual Not a Christmas party for all the non-Christians they knew. Susan requested that he bring two frozen Sara Lee Boston cream pies. I called him Christmas evening to wish him a happy happy and noticed that he sounded a bit distracted. I didn't think much of it until he mentioned that he had gotten mugged. Mugged, I shouted. What happened? Matt had taken the J Church streetcar from our place to 16th and Church where he planned to walk over to the BART station. As he got off the bus, this guy walked up to him and calmly said, I've got a gun. Give me all your money. Did you see the gun? I asked incredulous. No, he replied. Well, then why did you give him your money? If it would have been me, I would have wanted to see the gun to be sure that I was really being held up at gunpoint. Then the alleged gunman demanded Matt's bus transfer, leaving him no way to get home except on foot. But the final insult, he demanded that Matt give him the two frozen Sara Lee Boston cream pies. As the gunman hopped onto the bus with the pies, he turned to Matt and said, by the way, Merry Christmas. A couple of weeks later, one of Matt's friends let slip that Matt had indeed had a trick in my bathtub and in my bed, to be exact, while I was in OKC. See, I said to him, God punished you, serves you right, getting robbed for having a trick in when I ask you not to. But he still looked good in those white briefs, so I chose not to see this red flag. A little earlier in the year, after Mark was let go, my car was rear-ended by a muni driver in his Buick land yacht. I was stopped at a light and got totally creamed in the back end of my little red Celica. This was the one and only time my new title came in handy. We both got out of our cars, and I walked back to survey the damage. I also asked the other driver for his ID, which he didn't want to give me. Hey, man, you're making me late for work, he shouted. Give me your driver's license number and your muti ID number, and I'll move on, I said evenly. Talking evenly was a challenge. He was a foot taller and outweighed me by 200 pounds. I could well imagine him beating the crap out of me. There was no choice but just brazen it out. Listen, I said. I'm the director of visual merchandising for the entire chain of Roos Brothers stores. I'm late for an important meeting because you hit my car. Now I'm going to take as much time as I need and I'll call the police if I need to. Knees shaking, I headed for the payphone across the street and then he came forth with all the information. Later, when I contacted the insurance company, I was afraid they were going to total the car because it was so old. Someone recommended a German man's body shop run by a man named Dieter who wasn't too hard on the eyes. He seemed to take a shine to me. I looked especially fetching in my painted-on jeans. So when I told him of my concern, he said, Viva si that this does not happen. My apologies to all English-speaking Germans for this rendition of your accent. When I called to check up on the car... Dieter told me that the insurance company had decided to repair the damage. I'm sure there was some fast talking on Dieter's part. Of course, there was one hitch. Since the damage was from the door's back, the insurance company would pay only to paint the rear end. As the rest of the car looked like tomato soup because red fades so quickly, I would have a two-tone car. Dieter suggested that, to make a good job of it, I should repaint the whole car. However, I didn't have the dough to be spending on paint jobs, so I had to think fast. 
Sighing, I said, Dieter, just do the primer on the back. I guess I'll just have to take it to Earl Scheib to make it all one color. For those of you who haven't heard of Earl Scheib, this was the absolute bottom of the barrel of the discount auto painters back in the day. Then I sighed again helplessly, eyes downcast, thankful that I had worn my very tight jeans again. Poor Dieter cringed at this offense to German precision, and I could hear him grinding his teeth. It only took a few moments. Viva see what we can do, he finally said. Call me next week. The following Saturday, Dieter called and said, Your car is ready. Come pick it up. When I walked into the body shop, I could not believe my eyes. Dieter had painted my little Celica Ferrari red. You know, the blue red with no hint of orange that hurts the eyes to look at in bright sunlight. The paint was shiny like glass, and Dieter had even cleaned the vinyl top so it was white again, polished the mag wheels, and replaced the white pinstriping. It looked like a new car. And this is where I have to put out, I thought, wondering just how that particular transaction would play out. Miss Manners didn't comment on that one. Would it happen right there, or would we make a date for later? I wondered. Dieter, how much do I owe you for this? Ah, oh, it's nothing. Just leftover paint from another job. And I didn't even have to do him for this, even though I would have gladly. Matt was the first one to put a scratch on it. I was backing the car out of the garage, and Matt was waiting by the garage door to pull it down. I was halfway out when he started pulling the door down, so the garage door smacked down right across the hood of the car. Thinking he had just hit a snag, he started pulling down vigorously on the garage door handle, which just made the fresh crease across the hood deeper. I started honking and calling in some very unkind names. It took a few moments, but he finally noticed the rather large object that was hanging up the garage door. You stupid son of a bitch, didn't you think to look at what you hit? Goddamn, look at this crease. This was an expensive paint job, you stupid-ass jerk, I shouted as I surveyed the damage. But he still looked good in those white briefs, so I chose not to see this red flag. Since we were living together, I started calling Matt my boyfriend. It seemed like a legitimate assumption. I discovered, much to my dismay that he wasn't seeing it the same way. It started when I noticed that he wasn't interested in sex. I would initiate, and he would give me the cold shoulder. Assuming I had done something wrong, Matt would always let me know when something I did reminded him of his ex, I badgered him until he finally talked about it. I am not your husband. I am not your boyfriend, he shouted. Just because we're living together doesn't mean we're married. Well, you could have knocked me down. At the time, I felt really wounded, but looking back as I write this, I'm thinking, what an ungrateful asswipe. He was all right with my paying his lodging so he could save money, but didn't want to commit to anything except being good friends. That moment was when I knew he wouldn't be the one I would grow old with. So you ask, how long did you stay with him? Five and a half years. What an idiot, huh? but he still looked good in those white briefs, so I chose not to see this red flag. By February of 1983, Matt had saved enough money to get a place and have his things moved from Texas. He asked me one Sunday morning if I would move in with him. My first reaction was to say no, which I did. He gave me this wounded look and left the apartment. I knew I'd hurt his feelings, but this was my gut reaction. For a few days, he and I didn't talk much. He started looking for an apartment, and I began drawing classes at City College. One night, I got home from class, unlocked the door, and came in. The lights were out. I felt a hand clamp over my mouth, and I heard Matt whisper, Don't make a sound. Ooh, I thought, this is a new game. I'm going to be the young beauty ravished by the intruder. Ooh. I've called the police, he whispered. Someone's broken in next door. He's still inside. 
I could hear someone next door, obviously ransacking the place. We both stood in the dark, listening. The doorbell made us both jump. It was the police. The entire SWAT team came in, guns drawn, and swarmed through my place, add on to the little balcony inside the front door and everywhere. I, of course, was mortified. The place was a mess, and oh great, the entire San Francisco police SWAT team comes to visit. I busied myself trying to tidy up. Matt was much more sensible in this situation. He grabbed me, pulled me to the floor, and said, God damn it, get down, we could get shot. Well, that would be mercy killing. I'm dying of embarrassment as it is, I said. Look at this place. The SWAT team broke into the place next door, chased, and finally caught the guy. He was taken away in handcuffs. A little background about the married couple next door. When I moved in, they were newlyweds. She was an erotic dancer at the Mitchell Brothers O'Farrell Theater, which was the X-rated place in the Tenderloin that had a fantasy undersea mural painted on the outside, and he was a projectionist there. They met when he saw her do a bride striptease. I'm not making this up. When she came out in the wedding gown and commenced to gyrate and strip, he fell in love hard. Really, you can't make this kind of stuff up. I used to ponder her dancing career. Since my living room window was at a right angle to her kitchen window, I could watch her cook Sunday breakfast in the nude, not even an apron, whenever I wanted to or not, and I wanted not to. She was built like a boy, two pennies on a plank, as my grandma used to say. As I can't remember her name, I'll call her Penny. One day I drove Penny to work. I drove up from work one afternoon, and she looked so panicked standing in front of the building that I asked what was wrong. She was late. The cab hadn't shown. So I offered to drive her to work, and as we drove along, I chatted her up about her job. Like you know, the management encourages us to go and like basically mingle with the customers after we dance. They want the customers to know that we are like uh, intelligent as well as, you know, beautiful and um, talented dancers. Indeed. After a while, the marriage went on the rocks. What a surprise. Penny started seeing some low-level thug, and Mr. Husband moved out, heartbroken. He loved her, poor guy. Did I mention he wasn't too bright? A little time went on, and Penny decided that she was tired of the thug as well, so she gave him the heave-ho. But Mr. Thug was having none of it, hence the break-in. I didn't hear anything from Penny for a couple of days as she was staying away. Finally, one afternoon, I ran into her in the hall and asked about what was happening. She told me she had decided not to press charges. Why, I asked incredulous. He broke into your house and ransacked the place. Don't you think he might do you some harm? Like he's like threatened my family like if I do, she mumbled. Well, girl, working in a place like that, I'm sure you can find some sort of protection if you know what I mean. It's like cool, man. It's like cool. I know what I'm doing. It was about three in the morning, two weeks later. I awoke to hearing Tara, my downstairs neighbor who lived directly below the happy couple, pounding on the door and screaming, God damn it, shut the hell up, people are trying to sleep. I heard the door open and a man's slurred, druggy voice say, Hey, it's cool, we'll be quiet, it's cool. I waited until Tara got back to her apartment and phoned down. Ken, I can hear everything that goes on in that place, the floors are so thin. I'm hearing him say things like, I'm going to cut you up, I'm going to put you in the hospital, so I've called the police. So, yet another visit from the SWAT team, along with the ambulance and the medics. It was quite an evening. I didn't go out into the hall to watch all this. It was just too close to home. It reminded me of those nights when Mom and Don battled when I was a teenager. The next morning, though, when I left for work, I wasn't prepared for the sight. It looked like a Sharon Tate murder revisited. There was blood everywhere, smeared along the walls, on the carpet, All the way down the stairs, it was just too gruesome. That evening, I told Matt we could look for a place together. Noe Valley was getting too weird for me. My requirements for the apartment were two bedrooms, central location, and my part of the rent $300 a month. 
What we ended up with had a real fancy-sounding address, 33 Elgin Park, number 9. A double-digit address in a park, right? Top floor of a building like a penthouse, right? The reality was grittier than that. This was a piss-yellow and flamingo-pink poured concrete building from the 50s that had no architectural distinction whatever, inside or out. Thankfully, I had good furniture, as this place cried out for accessories. When we moved in, I had a little housewarming party where I invited all my friends. Some of them were people I'd met at Roost Brothers like Diane and Rick. But guess who didn't show up? This was the beginning of a pattern. Mark would always enthusiastically accept an invitation, but then had some sort of an excuse to cancel at the last minute, one that didn't make a lick of sense, but that was that. It was extremely disappointing, and I really didn't understand. It wasn't as if Mark had an actual job that he had to get up for, or had to do late hours for. He's a flake, Matt said as I got off the phone before the party. I don't know why you keep in contact with him. Especially lately, he never seems to be available. And if he does, he always cancels. Our new apartment building was right next to the Central Freeway before it crossed over Market Street. We were close enough that I could read the license plates on the cars that passed by on the lower level from my bedroom window. The neighborhood, which was all in the shadow of the freeway, was not the best, to put it mildly, but the rent was cheap and the landlord was very hands-off. At first I asked myself, what am I doing? doing because of the noise from the freeway, but believe it or not, I got used to it. I just convinced myself it was the sound of the ocean. The ocean had a beach as well. It was our roof. We had that really good view of the freeway, which was still a double-decker then, as this was before the 1989 earthquake. As I said, we could see the cars on the lower level from the apartment, but the retaining wall on the upper level was high enough that only really tall vehicles could see over the railing onto our roof. It was quite private up there. The roof itself was littered with stray car parts, which landed there from the various auto accidents on the freeway. That's how close we were. Many were the evenings when we would hear squealing tires, then a crash, then miscellaneous thunks and clunks on the roof. We could have had a side business dealing in used car parts. But on a sunny Sunday afternoon, having access to the roof saved a trek to the beach where it might either be crowded or fogged in. We had sun and privacy and the sound of the ocean. One particular sunny Sunday afternoon, Matt and I were up on the beach sunning in the nude. What with the sun, the tanning oil, and all. One thing led to another and we got up to misbehaving. Things were going along swimmingly when I heard a truck's air horn blasting. I looked up to see that traffic had jammed on the upper deck, marooning a very tall tour bus directly opposite our building. This bus was listing to the right as all the tourists from God knows where were plastered to the windows, ogling the two naked faggots who were fornicating right there in broad daylight. I even saw a couple of flashes from the cameras. So what's a boy to do? We just laughed and waved. In the next episode, Ken decides that homicide is not a career path. Thanks for listening. I'd like to thank BearWorldMagazine.com for sponsoring this podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you have questions or comments, you can reach me through the website, which is allgrownupnow.com. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kenneth D. King, on Facebook at Kenneth D. King Design, or on my main website, KennethDKing.com. <laughs>